Hello, this is Professor Truth, and I am very excited to announce a new show with my good friend and brother, Zen Garcia. And we will be doing a series on his trilogy called The Great Contest. With that, welcome Zen Garcia. I know you've been busy, that's for sure. Oh, goodness, yeah. How do you do it, Zen? Um, you know, I, I like to make productive use of my time. And so I always want to be in service uh, to the most high and the greatest capacity that I can. And so I stay vigilant with um, my service on behalf of him. So so, so what, what I'm hearing, and, and uh, this is interesting because, you know, we all, including myself, since we kind of were doing regular shows together five years ago, um, we both have grown in different ways and different directions. And, you know, the, the two of us will have a certain our common grounds and as well as new insights that can uh, even give further uh, perspective on our common grounds. But I guess one thing I, when I was reading the book of Enoch just this week for about the fifth or sixth time, I've read it a lot, many times. What it emphasized a lot was two groups, right? the chosen and the righteous, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, of course, the chosen are probably righteous and the righteous are probably chosen, but they're not necessarily, you know, necessarily the same groups. There's probably a subset, but um, right. does that come across it that way to you also? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because um, you have the seed of promise which uh, includes Israel and the children of Seth through Adam. And then you have the, what are the tares, the children of the wicked one, the children of Belial, the sons of darkness. And there's a, a subset that is the elect of them as well. And those are the New World Order elites. And so you have these two subsets of elites from the two different groups, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that uh, truly represent, you know, as far as those that are numbered and counted worthy, um, that are numbered amongst the uh, the elect, as far as the wheat, and then you have the larger group, the sheep. Uh, but of course, it's always the leaders that are the the real elite, uh, as far as the patriarchs and the prophets, all down through history. Um, and then you have the same with that elitist subset um, like the Nimrods and Nebuchadnezzars and um, Pharaoh, the elites that ruled on the thrones of the world in serving as the children of darkness for uh, direct relationship with their father, the devil, the synagogue of Satan, you know, those that that elitist group, which serves on the other side of it. And so you have these four subsets and and then you have all those that are in the middle and on the fence that are being swayed this way and that um, that are, you know, still um, determining their allegiance one way or the other. And so it's two different groups and then the extremities of, um, of both sides of light and darkness, good and evil, and, and how it is all playing out. But, you know, here on the earth, uh, because this is the plane for where the heavens and hell come together in union. We have the duality playing out, and this is the the second aspect of what is the original war in heaven, and the the division of light and darkness, and the separation of the forces of good and evil, and all of it now is playing out through the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, the children of humanity. Um, and so this is the next aspect of the game, the great contest, as I call it. And it is ongoing for what is the next uh, 7,000 years of the second world age, the 6,120 jubilees, which equal the 6,000 years. And then you have the well, 1,000 years of the millennial reign, which equals the, the Sabbath day of rest. And so all of that equals to the fullness of what is the 
7,000 years of the second world age. And so all of that is playing out and we're, you know, at the end game now. So, Wow. <laughs> that is even hard for me to follow. You, you, made, you made it sound simple, but it, you also included a very complex um, scenario. And so friends and folks, uh, listeners, um, Zen Garcia and Professor Truth will be going over all of what Zen says, c continuing now and until uh, until Yahweh tells us it's it's our time. Uh, we intend to continue the Great Contest series in in mutual collaboration. Uh, for it is now time, and all of us that are called and chosen have an assignment. And uh, this is just one of Zen's and my assignments to work together. And and Zen works with others as do I. I want to just kind of add my flavor to what. Zen said, because although it, I certainly, I mean, I agree with everything he said, I, we sometimes use semantics, different terminologies for certain things. One thing up front, though, I do want to clarify, Zen, you use the word um, Israel and the seed of the serpent, or Israel through, um, I forget who you said, but in any, anyway, Seth. Israel through Seth. And I agree with that, but I want to very carefully clarify the word Israel. We, we are we. There is always a counterfeit. There is a genuine, and then the enemy, the adversary. Oh, of course. The adversary uses the same words. Like there's two Enochs. There's a good Enoch and a bad Enoch. There's two mm -hmm. Lamechs, a good Lamech and a bad Lamech. Zen could go on better than I could in this area. But my point is, when Zen and I use the word Israel, we we mean the bloodline of Adam through Seth. Would would you right. agree, agree with that, Zen? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and then you also went into um, the the various permutations and combinations. I tend to, I haven't actually ever taught this yet, but I intend to, Yahweh willing. And that is uh, the four rivers of Eden. And the, the two seed lines, the seed of the woman and the seed of Nakash, or the serpent as defined in the King James. It's really Nakash, a, a, a fallen angel. Could be Lucifer. Uh, in the book of Enoch, I believe it's chapter 68, it's called God Drael. Or, and any time, correct me, Zen, because you know this better than I do. And so, in any case, there's two bloodlines. There's a war of the bloodlines. Uh, in my teachings, I call it Two seed line theology, Zen calls it uh, serpent seed or, or something similar. Um, but this is critical, and it's based on Genesis three fifteen, and we'll be getting into that in future series. Uh, in fact, I believe your second book in this trilogy is is on that subject, is it not, Zen? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in my opinion, this book, the Great Contest Two, enmity between the seed lines, covers in greater detail, more elaboration than any other book I've ever seen or read um, about this particular topic and how it interweaves all throughout the biblical narrative. Because when you have this as discernment, uh, what Christ says in, um, in Matthew 13 that uh, about those that have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the mind to understand that this is what he said, I will utter secrets that have been kept since the foundations of the world, that since the garden and since the, um, the outcast of Cain and the separation of these two bloodlines and the ongoing enmity and war between them, which resulted in Abel being the first casualty of this war, being murdered by his half-brother Cain, that the seed of the serpent has been working from the shadows and under the directive of Lucifer, Samael, the angel of death, uh, as is stated in Genesis chapter 3 in the, the Targum, the Aramaic rendition of the Hebrew Torah. Um, he's called Azazel in the, um, in the ap apocalypse of Abraham, but in my opinion, they're all you know the, all the same. The one that was cast out, that had one third of the angels join him in rebellion, that became Satan, the adversary. Uh, many of these names or titles, uh, but they are all referencing the same being and the same 
um, what we know to be the adversary, the angel of death. And so all of that is connected to even what we see in this day and age with the New World Order elites in warring against the seed of Adam and the masses. And there is still this ongoing contention. And whereas most people believe that this war was ended with the flood of Noah's day, that this serpent seed line, even if it did exist, that it was wiped out in the flood. Uh, if you study Matthew 13 carefully, the kingdom of the, the parable of the kingdom, as well as the parable of the sower, it tells us that the angels asked, um, asked the word if he wants them to, to gather up the tares. And, and he tells them, no, unless you pull up the wheat in the gathering. And so he says, let both grow together until the time of the end. And that at the time of the end, he will send his angels forth as the reapers to gather the tares for burning and the wheat for preservation. And he makes clarity on this issue that the harvest will be at the end of days, three separate times. Actually, there's four allusions to it in Matthew 13 alone. And so, and he also clarifies to his apostles that after the multitudes are sent away, they come up and ask him, tell us what is the parable of the tares of the field? We know it not. And so he explains to them, and verifies that they understand by giving the parable of the wheat and the tares and then also the parable of the casting forth of the net, uh, the gathering of the seed at the end of the days. And then even in Matthew 25, he repeats with the parable of the goat and the sheep. And so multiple, multiple times and multiple witnesses, he clarifies and, and confirms that the apostles understand and know this teaching because this is the most critical aspect of what we see um, with regard to how the story of Genesis ties together with Revelation and everything in between. It is the skeleton key for understanding why the genealogies were collected and why they were regarded and recorded so carefully. Uh, most people, the mainstream churches, they don't understand and they think all of that is just boring and they don't even read it. They don't, uh, they glance right over it because it has no meaning for them. And yet when you do understand that there are two bloodlines and physical progenies here upon the earth and that they are warring with one another, then it makes sense as to not only why we see uh, a certain bloodline perpetuating the evil and that they are the cause, the root for what we see with regard to the perpetuation and the propagation of evil, the order out of chaos and the, um, the wars and the slaughter of the innocents and uh, the ongoing decimation of peoples worldwide, uh, that all of that is part of the blood sacrifice, which is demanded by their father, the devil. And so, Understanding these things, then it makes sense as to why Yahweh also demanded of Israel before they had fallen away to not involve themselves in these pagan rites. Because these, these pagan religions, the cultures and civilizations which grew up doing things like sacrificing their own children um, in the fires of Moloch or involving themselves in blood or victim sacrifice, or even uh, these huge fertility rites and sexual orgies and um, in connection to the their faith and the religion and their practice of it, all of these abominations and, you know, temple prostitutes, things like that, the homosexuality, the bestiality and the, the, the bisexuality, all these different rituals and uh, practices, all of that was connected to these pagan rituals, which uh, the giants and also the, the Canaanites, the Kenites, 
practice in worshiping their father, the rebel, uh, the rebel angels, their fathers, the fallen angels, and the watchers. And so this is why we see throughout history and throughout the um, the wars of Yahuwah and and Yeshua against Lucifer and the Archons and the sons of Anak, uh, we see the declaration to not involve themselves in such manner with such uh, abomination. And yet, um, continuously, Israel falls away and is led astray uh, into practicing and performing and involving themselves in such things, which is why they were divorced in the first place. And why it was that the Gentiles were grafted in and salvation and grace extended to all people everywhere. And so the story is complex, but when you understand the underlying truth of what connects all these things together, then you are able to uh, piece together the puzzle of truth and fullness to finally be able to understand it in manner that we are supposed to be able to uh, comprehend it in. Wow, Zen, you you really have uh, you really have polished your skills of eloquency and speaking. Um, you went over so many topics again. Uh, the, par- the, the the incredibly important parables of the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats, how they're intertwined, how the apostles sp- asked and uh, Yeshua. Which, by the way, Zen and I will be using both the Hebrew Yahweh Yeshua as well as Jesus Christ. Um, and Father, interchangeably, uh, I, I tend to say whatever your heart language is. If, if you're if you're Italian and you speak Italian, whatever the word for Yahweh is in Italian, that's just fine. Okay, so we're not. Um, it's not. A, it's not an issue with the Father if if he knows who you're talking to. Um, but you went over so many things there, Brother Zen. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize Israel, the bloodline of Jacob, Isaac. As and when you use the word Gentile, um, that that I, I will add a little bit of my um, t- my understandings. The word Gentile it, it was n- n- never in the Hebrew or the Greek. It is a Latin word, and if you look it up, it really means nations. And so. And also, just Zen, we've really pretty much started the show. So, just between me and you, the TGC, the Great Contest, is, will be at another one of Professor Truth's smart word shows. So we're we're going to avoid the J word as much as possible, and we're going to avoid um, words that will you know get us flagged and that sort of thing. And I think you're doing an excellent job. But I wanted to bring that up because it's, we live, folks, we live in a time where the war has escalated and the enemy, which Zen so eloquently described, has ratcheted up, getting ready for the next wave of a, assault upon uh, the bloodlines of Adam. And, and, and Adam's blood has mixed in all the nations, and that's the blessings to all the nations. And nation is a better word than Gentile, if you want to... Inc- mm-hmm put nation, that would be a better translation. But um, in any case, we all know what, what, what is being stated here. Um, my gosh, <laughs> you covered so much already. Um, it, 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 I will say this, though, uh, and I totally agree w- with Brother Zen that if a person does not understand who true biblical Israel is, not the counterfeit in the Middle East, and doesn't understand who the true bloodline of Adam and those that have the blood of Adam are. And that's why I tend to teach the four rivers of Eden. You have the pre-Adamic. They're called natural man. Okay. Then you have the Genesis 126. Let us make Adam in our image and likeness. And those are those that have the Adamic blood in them, uh, but they're not the natural men. And then you have the Genesis 2-7, and Yahweh breathed Neshema into Ha, the Adam, the first prototype. And then you have the fourth group, which would be your tares. And those are what we, we're using the word tares. We're using the word um, adversaries' children. 
That's a good one. ACs, Antichrists, Adversaries, Children. It's a good code word. Sometimes I use usual suspects. They're all the same for the evil seed that has caused all this. Actually, it's a revenge card because as Zen and I get into the teachings of the Great Contest, you'll see that the angelic wars that started way, way in the eons, ages past, are continuing and, and are continuing into the future. And the only card that Lucifer really knows that he has to play, because he's lied even to his own kind, that he's lied to them that, that they have a chance. And I'll sometimes I'll get into um, some maybe more technical aspects from my friend Colonel S.C. and others. Uh, one of the agendas is Lucifer is trying to, quote, clone a, sinle- a sinless vessel or host container that he can transfer its soul or consciousness into and then not be under the judgment of sin and then transfer the whole timeline that he's on off of this current timeline toward perdition. Now, that's pretty... We'll we'll get into more of that in the future, but I wanted to just bring you a different angle on what Lucifer's playing card is, but he's lied to his followers that they can uh, escape the judgment we know that they cannot because the Bible is a supernatural book, we, but they are trying to, through time travel, cloning, and other technologies, to escape Yahweh's wrath. But it's coming. One one topic, Zen, you did bring up that I might have a different view, but to be honest, um, I change my views as I hear things because there's a lot of scripture that really is hidden for these times, as the book of Daniel says, it will be unrolled for the end. And I'm not sure about, I was talking to some brothers today about the thousand year millennial in uh, Revelation chapter 20. Um, to me, it could be literal as you described it, and and some of the other brethren I talked to look, see it as. Um, I'm just not sure, because you know, it, I believe that if you're in 4D, because we're in 3D, three-dimensional here, and from my perspective, there's thir- 12 dimensions plus one, 12 with time and 13 with no time, and that's where Yahweh, the singularity is. But the 12, that there's seven above, five below, and we're in three below. So in technically, Zen and I and the rest of you are already in a level of damnation. We are judged and we are in a level. However, we are in a level that still holds the opportunity, what I call the parole opportunity of redemptive opportunity. Uh, If you go to four below, you're you're pretty much set. And that's where the book of Enoch describes the different chambers for the different types of rebellious souls or those that are righteous. But as long as you have a breath, time is the time is the metric of that you have and how you use it. And earlier in the show, when I was talking with Zen and he said, I said, Zen, what have you been up to? You know, this is awesome for me and Zen to be, be together again. And, and Zen said, well, he's dedicated to righteousness and serving to full capacity. And he Zen has such elegant words, uh, serving Yahweh, serving Yeshua, Jesus Christ, serving God incarnate, um, Isaiah nine, six, you know, the almighty, Uh, the Almighty God, um, Emmanuel. Zen's dedicated more. In fact, I often see, you know, Zen, I say this often. And I, I, believe me, I say what I mean, and sometimes I put my foot in my mouth. But Zen sets the bar for humility, for dedication, for focus. Um, He and I may say things with different words, but really he sets the bar for the rest of us for dedication. And uh, we we have no excuse when we look at at the hard work that Brother Zen has done. But you brought up a lot of excellent points, Brother Zen. I do want to say that the tares, the goats, or whatever you want to call them, are truly hybrid nakash with human women, which is in Genesis 6. It's also in the Book of Enoch. Um, It's also in the Targums. And Zen and I will get into that in the future. These shows will be going on for some time. And... And so the tares are actually reptilian, seraph, fallen seraph angels that have hybridized with mankind. And that's why um, God said, 
to his angels, do not pluck them up because they can shape shift to look just like mankind. And in fact, they do. And by just mere appearance, which is mo- what most people go on, you cannot tell a difference. But Yeshua, Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. And Zen so eloquently described their fruit is pure evil. Over to you, Zen. Yeah, I want to really quickly just share for those that are not familiar with my work or the things that I do. Uh, the last time we talked, and I sent you my 11th book, The Great Contest, War in Heaven, and also my 12th book, which is The Great Contest Two: The Enmity Between the Seed Lines. And you don't know, but I'm working on my 20th book right now. And so since that time, uh, last that I talked with you, I have published many other books. And so I'll catch you up to speed with that. I released a a three-book set um, on the Great Commissions, which for those that don't know, it's all of the – you know, we have one book of Acts in the the Bible, but there are literally – dozens of manuscripts that speak about the Great Commission, the, uh, the, the apostles being told to go forth and to teach the gospel into all the parts of the world. And so because most people are not familiar with a lot of that material, I compiled it. Uh, the first two are on the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospels of the Apostles, and it contains Many, many books that most people have never heard about. Um, And then the third book is the gathering of the apocalyptic materials, all the end times stories such as um, Ezra's number four, the Greek apocalypse of Baruch, the apocalypse of Elijah, uh, the apocalypse of Adam and Abraham and all these different apocalyptic texts, the apocalypse of Thomas, the apocalypse of Peter, the vision of Paul, all these different books that are specific to the end of days, the last times. And so all of those books are part of that Great Commission 3. And then I also released a a book, uh, Yeshua Christ, the Infancy, Childhood, and Lost Years, Um, which is an amazing text because it covers all the stories of Joachim and Anna and Mary and leading up to uh, all the different infancy gospels of Christ and the life of Christ. And I also released a text called the Gospel of Gamaliel, which most people do not know about, that also covers in great detail. It's the most extensive and elaborate story of the Passion of Christ and also the Uh, the death of Mary, his mother, the Virgin, as well as the martyrdom of Pilate. It carries you through all the life and the stories of all three, that of Christ and his passion, and then the Virgin and also the martyrdom of Pilate. Uh, It's an incredible story. It's over 100 pages in and of itself, and it gives more detail and greater elaboration on the passion than any other text I've ever read or discovered. And then the the last two that I've been working on uh, as of late, uh, well, I released a book called Paradise, the Sides of the North and the Mount of the Congregation that decrypts what that actually means, where the sides in the north are, uh, where the throne of the Most High God is established, where the opening and the portals leading into the heavens as well as to the bottomless pit, the abysmal chasm, are all located, and how um, you know how it all ties in with Jacob's ladder and all these different aspects of the structure of the uh, the cosmology. So people can check that out. But the two books that I've been working on of late, and the one that I'm working on now, is a companion book to the Testament of the Patriarchs and the Prophets, which is a book that covers all the the various testaments from Adam, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, the 12 patriarchs of the 12 tribes, um, Moses, Job, Solomon, 
uh, the Odes of Solomon, all these different texts, which again, most people are not familiar with. But the reason I compiled them is because in studying those testaments, it shows to you, um, and I've also been speaking about of late, the Revelation of the Magi, which is a text that was just released by uh, an ancient Syriac and Hebrew Aramaic language scholar named Brent Landau. And he translated and released for the first time to the public uh, a second century Syriac text, which is about 50 pages long, which speaks about the Magi and who they were. And he speaks about how the story of the Magi and the Star of Bethlehem, that it was told, and this is all part of the book that I'm writing now called The Ancient Prophecies of Christ, which, again, is a companion for the Testament of the Patriarchs and the Prophets. And the reason I compiled it and the reason I brought it forth is because when you study all of those Testaments, it was known that uh, Adam was told, even when he was being expelled from paradise, that Yeshua would come into the flesh and be born of a virgin at a certain time and a certain period and that he would fulfill a prophecy of his coming and that it would also fulfill the Levitical feast days that were mandated for observation by Israel uh, in Leviticus 23, um, that also it, he would fulfill the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 with the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent at the same time that was nipping at his heel, um, that he would also when he died on the cross and was crucified and died on the cross as the Passover lamb, that he would then descend down into Sheol and free Adam and all of his righteous descendants from Abraham's bosom and then return them to their former estate, baptizing them in the Archerosian lake. They would be allowed to enter again into New Jerusalem, the city of God. And so, all of that, in fact, was fulfilled in, uh, in great manner, in great detail, in books such as the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Gospel of Bartholomew, uh, the accounts of Simeon's children, which were also raised in resurrection with Christ and that um, were given as witness and, and that were uh, gave the account of the resurrection, their resurrection by Christ. Um, to the Pharisees and to Nicodemus and Gamaliel, which is all part of the Gospel of Gamaliel and other stories. And so all of these prophecies were fulfilled, but they were all known by the children of Adam and passed down through the generations. And so when you read like the Testaments of Adam, uh, the Testaments of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Twelve Patriarchs and Enoch and the the witness of the Son of Man, the prophecies on the Son of Man and the elect one. You have all these, over 300 just in the Old Testament, but then all these other thousands of passages which speak about Yeshua's coming and how he would enter into the flesh and be born of Adam's seed, uh, as is specified in Luke chapter 3, and also the Cave of Treasures and the Book of the Bee have extensive genealogies of Christ, which, interestingly enough, exclude Cain from his lineage uh, because Cain was not part of uh, the seed of Adam and he was not a natural born son of Adam's. Um, and that's just confirming witness to that. But anyways, so he would be born of Adam's line and dying and being resurrected, he would redeem humanity and rectify the fall. And so all of these teachings were passed down through the generations, and this new text that just came to light, the Revelation of the Magi, it speaks about in this text that, um, that Yeshua would be the star of Bethlehem, and that it would, be, it, it would be his divine embodiment, and that he would lead, he would come and descend down into this world, and that he would lead the Magi, who were the children of Seth. They were the, the line of Adam through Seth because the prophecies were given to them. And so they created a secret order that 
watched for and were vig vigilant in looking for the mystical signs of Christ coming into this world. And so it was during the time of the Magi that they were led by this star to this place called the Cave of Treasures, which the Cave of Treasures is where Adam and Eve first lived and where the descendants of Adam and Eve, Seth's line, had lived up until the time that they were relocated. And so all of these ancient writings and all of these testimonies were left there in legacy for the Magi. And so when they were led there to the Cave of Treasures, they found all these ancient writings and all these ancient testimonies. And then they, in gathering them, they were, they were the ones that uh, repeated and shared in uh, multiplicity these particular stories. And it's my opinion that's how we were restored and given all of these ancient accounts and all of these ancient prophecies about the coming of Christ. And not only that, but um, what people don't know is that the gifts that they brought to Yeshua when he was born and entered into this world, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, those were three items that were given to Adam when he was cast out and expelled from paradise. The gold was to bring him comfort and light during darkness and during the night, which he had never experienced the night previous to his fall. And the frankincense and the myrrh were to bring peace and comfort to him and to remind him of paradise and from whence he had uh, been expelled from. And so those three things were still found in the Cave of Treasures, and the Magi gathered them, and they brought them as gifts to Christ, which was also told in the Testament of Adam. Adam tells the story of how, and Eve also, about their being expelled from paradise, and that God allowed them to get to take these gifts with them, and it was the word that was speaking to them that gave them the prophecies of his coming. And he also told them that you will bring to me these particular gifts, that his seed, his children, would bring them to him as gifts when he entered the flesh. And that's exactly what happens as revealed in the revelation of the Magi. So um, that book that just came out, and it came out after I had, started the the work on this particular book and this particular manuscript, The Ancient Prophecies of Christ, which I should be done with sometime this spring. Um, and so that book was a confirming witness to all of the information and the, the whole premise and postulation that I'm bringing forth in that particular text that all of these testaments and all of these prophecies that were laid out in these testaments of the patriarchs and the prophets, it confirm without a doubt that Christ is the only begotten Son and that he preexisted with the Father and the Holy Spirit and that um, uh, all of these things are contained within not just the Old Testament prophecies, but in many, many hundreds uh, of extra biblical prophecies as I bring forth and share and tie together with the different aspects of uh, the prophetic lines, the, the different prophecies that were fulfilled, as I told you, the 5,500 years prophecy, the seed of the woman crushing the head of the seed of the serpent, the Levitical feast days, how all that was fulfilled and how the his second advent will fulfill the remaining fall feast. All of these things are revealed in great detail and elaboration in this book. And so when people read it, it should help them to understand without a doubt that Christ is a God incarnate and that Amen. he came to redeem the, the fall and to rectify humanity. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is Yahweh incarnate. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. God's Zen. salvation. My goodness. That's what his name means. It means what? Son, say that again. God's salvation. Yeshua means Yah's salvation. Yeah, Yah salvation. Yahweh saves or Yah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, 
I'm going to say a prayer after that. Holy Father, Yahweh, Yeshua, thank you so much for this time with Brother Zen. The wisdom that the world that you will lead to hear this interview and the future interviews, and and we, we thank you so much for the opportunity to bring Brother Zen and myself together for this purpose. But, Father, just, just call those that, that you know have a yearning and are predestined for you to hear this. And the books that Zen has been gifted to write, my goodness, he certainly has a high calling. Uh, Father, may you bless Zen and his loved ones and protect him and provide for him and comfort him. And may you also do the same for those that, that are led, that you lead, because you call us. We do not seek you. You call us. That you call, may you bless them also. And thank you, Father, in, in Yeshua's name, Jesus Christ. Br- Brother Zen, you want to add to that prayer? Uh, yes, I would just add, uh, Father, to help bless those that truly love you and that have an inherent yearning to seek you and to study your word and to show themselves approved in such manner that want to understand the greater things of this world and why we are here and what all of this is really about and that don't accept um, all the ambiguity of the mainstream teachings that just gloss over everything and that go to um, the whole Thing of prosperity and um, you know just uh, the meaningless teachings that lead so many to want to abandon their efforts and abandon their pursuits and to get involved in the world and to seek out pleasure and answer in the carnalities of this world that those that truly are wanting answer and guidance and direction for the larger reasons of who we are and what we are here to do that they can find them in the works of individuals like myself and Professor Truth and the others out there that are truly bringing the meat of your word to the banquet table so that they can feast and fill themselves and then go forth and to confirm and to seek greater uh, and more intimate relationship with you because really that's what it's about is the understanding and to gain personal relationship by seeking you through your word. And that's where the answers are for all of us. And so we ask that even everybody listening go forth and to doubt even all that we bring here in this show and in the other aspects of our work, to, to go forth and confirm this in relationship with you and through your word uh, to see if this is truth and that it resonates with them and brings them uh, answer in more profound and deeper aspect. And uh, that's what we are here to do, to service you in this manner and to bring forth remembrance and to help others to gain proper understanding of the way that the war in heaven and our pre-existence and predestination, our election is tied to the circumstances and situations for are coming into this world in the manner that we find ourselves uh, living out in our daily lives that hopefully so many more uh, because of our calling and because of our work will come to understand and come to remembrance and who they are and empower themselves and decide to stand up for your truth and to stand up for what we are here to do Uh, because so many have been commissioned. um, And as we talk uh, and as we've stated so many times that many are chosen, but few heed the call. Uh, But hopefully more and more because of the work that we do, we'll choose to do so. And in that way, more and more will come to remembrance and and assist in the work of these times, because in my opinion, we are at the end of days and these the hour is late, and so there's much yet to do. Amen. Amen. Indeed, the hour is late, and I, I certainly uh, certainly commend Brother Zen on that prayer. And Yahweh, I know you will uh, you will hear hear our prayers for our heart is is right before you. And Brother Zen's dedication is certainly obvious as as is mine. And we are not 
claiming to be special, but we are claiming to be servants. And but the time is is nigh. And Zan did make the point, you know, and, and we've said this on other shows and I always make the same comment. Zen encourages you not to, you know, listen to certainly the lying system of religion out there. Uh, and he encourages you even to check out what he and I say. And, and I do, too. But I have a caveat. You should listen to what Zen and I say <laughs> because, <laughs> because your time is so short. And here's right. here's why. I would even put it differently. I would say honor the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. If you do just that, I, I often teach on some of my other shows with Brother John and Pastor Eli that it, it is not certainly the Bible is a supernatural word of God. It, you can. This is beyond. We're not going to prove it here on this show. If you don't understand that, you really need to pray and repent. But where I'm going with this is. It's not the words on the page like Zen, and I will encourage you to read the scriptures, certainly, certainly. But Zen would agree that every time we read the scriptures, even if it's the same verse and chapter for the 50th time, guess what? Yahweh imparts new vision, new wisdom, because wisdom is a gift. And so in these late times, if, if God, Yahweh, Yeshua, Jesus Christ sees your heart motive— that you really are seeking him, as Zen said, seek him with all your heart, mind, and soul, the first commandment. And you really are out of the right, pure heart motive. It can't be because you, you've tried all of your ways and they didn't work. And as your last resort, you seek God. No, that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for you to seek him first, have faith in him first. And he imparts faith as a gift, wisdom as a gift, calling as a gift, predestination as a gift. In fact, the entire Bible is his promises to those that earnestly seek him. And my point being, if you simply open your Bible, repent and pray, he will download and away. I'll use the word awaken, then use the word remembrance. Okay, they're basically the same. And the New Agers use this word awakening. They copycat God's holy holiness. So Zen and I are saying, you have a remembrance of who you were. I'm, I'm going to say Yahweh will awaken you and, and activate, reactivate who you were. And in so doing, Yahweh, God incarnate, Jesus Christ, by your seeking him, by choice, by your heart motive of obedience, your heart motive of obedience to seek him because he loved us first, demonstrated that at Calvary. Your motive of obedience, opening that word and doing your best to set a seventh of your time, a Sabbath of your time aside, seeking him in the word and in prayer and, and, and in repentance. Because time is short, Jesus Christ will download you infinite amount of wisdom in in a, in the amount of time you will you will never have before the sun comes back, <laughs> would you agree with that, Zen? Uh, absolutely, yes, most certainly. I, I want uh, to comment on a couple other things you mentioned. As w first, what is the name of the third book in this particular series, A Great Contest? Uh, it's the Great Contest, and the it will either be the Sons of Anak or something to do with the Sons of Anak and. Uh, the New World Order. Uh, I haven't finished it yet. Um, most of it is written. I just am finishing up the ancient prophecies of Christ, and then I will get into uh, finishing the third book of the Great Contest. But basically, it will be about um, – because in the second book of the trilogy, I cover the story of how the war in heaven ties to the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that began in the garden with the temptation of Eve explaining what the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, how it led to her sorrowful conception and the enmity between the two bloodlines, the fruit and the seed and how it connects to descendants and progeny. I bring forth in this second book the story of Genesis 3, 4, and 5 from the Septuagint, the King James, and also the Targum, the Aramaic Targum renditions of that story. 
and then I bring forth also the the ancient um, commentaries from the the various the church fathers, the rabbinical commentaries that ex explain um, the serpent seed and all of that, the legends of the Jews, the traditions of the Jews, um, all of those teachings, and and then I talk about how this ties together from the the enmity between and the murder of Cain, uh, I mean Abel by Cain, and how it continues between Cain and Seth uh, to Noah, and then how the serpent seed continued on through uh, and on to the ark, and how that ties together with um, the story of um, Moses and uh, Egypt, Joseph, um, the the children of Ishmael, and as far as Ishmael and Isaac and the enmity between them, uh, Abraham's children, and then Jacob and Esau, um, and then also with their children, the 12 tribes, and how that all tied together with Moses and, you know, Joseph and the freeing of, the, uh, of Israel from Egypt and the war uh, with Joshua and the sons of Anak, Saul and the Amalekites, David and Goliath, all the way to the time of Christ. and All of this, this is in your third book of this trilogy? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, it, it covers the enmity between the two bloodlines all the way up until the time of Christ. But in this third book, uh, I will cover from there going forward and how it ties together with what we see in the current world with the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and the, also the, you know, the fulfillment of prophecy, Genesis three fifteen, with the crushing of the of the serpent's head uh, by Christ when he died on the cross. Uh, all of that is part of and leading up to the new world order in our current times. That will be part of this this new book. And so, um, most of again, most of that is written. It elaborates on the giants and. Uh, the connections with all of that, but um, it's more focused on helping people to understand how the war, even between Pharisees, the Pharisees and Christ, where he said that, you know, you are of your father, the devil, and he said, he basically said that their fathers and their bloodlines and their genealogies have always practiced assassination, that they killed um, that they were responsible for the murder of the prophets from Abel to Zacharias, who was uh, uh, his, his cousin John the Baptist, his father. He was the high priest and killed in the Holy of Holies. And uh, it was then at, thereafter um, that they took over you know, the high priesthood. And John the Baptist, he was the rightful next high priest, but he was beheaded and he was— um, exiled to the wilderness, but, you know, he was the true head of prophecy. Um, I'd like to add one point of clarity. Um, the word Pharisee, of course, I use another code word for the usual suspects as Pharisites, but there was a time when the, the Pharisees were actually the bloodline of Isaac or the Hebrews. Um, they were later uh, usurped by the Edomites who moved in and then actually killed all the original bloodline of Isaac or bloodline of Adam Pharisees. Right. And, and then they usurped or took their name, counterfeited, you know, identity theft, just like today's Israel is an identity theft. They took the name Israel of the true biblical Israel, and they are not the same. But I wanted to make that clear that when Zen's yes. talking about Pharisees and when Jesus Christ was saying, your father was the devil, and he meant that literally, um, mm -hmm. seed in Hebrew is Zerah and seed in uh, Greek is sperma. These are literal posterity offspring of Nakash, the serpent right. seed line, okay? So Jesus meant that to that group of Pharisees living at the time of Jesus, but in ancient past, at the time of King David and Solomon, there were actually what they would call Pharisees that were of the bloodline of Adam. So they got usurped and replaced. Right. Yeah, and actually I, I write about when that began because if you, if you study in great detail, um, it was in Joshua chapter 10 where the, this particular Kenite tribe 
they act like they are from a faraway people and they um, they make a, a a pact with Joshua and then he spares them and he makes a, a vow with the princes of Israel to spare them and they make them servants unto the scribes. And that is when exactly. they yep. right. And that's when they infiltrated and became the servants of the scribes and the bearers of the firewood and the keepers of the the temple that that's where they got their foot in the door to and, and they later. took they that's took different. on the name you know they they identity theft they they take right. on the name of the authentic but they they're a counterfeit right exactly and that's your modus operandi uh throughout history Always. yes yeah. exactly um, you mentioned a couple a couple other amazing points, and we haven't even begun, folks. The introduction to his book, the, these shows are going to be eternal uh, and forever until uh, Yahweh uh, takes Zen and I home. And uh, but earlier, the Book of Acts. You said you wrote unbelievable, like twenty books by now. Bless you, brother. Um, but you said you worked on one uh, something like the. Uh, the Great Commission, and it was associated with the uh, Acts of the Apostles and the Gospels, if I recall. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to make the, the point that most people may not realize that the book of Acts sometimes is called the Gospel of Luke Part 2, because many believe it was actually written by the Apostle Luke. Do, are you aware of that, Zen? Uh, no, but um, it, it's good to know. And I'll actually I'll share with you... Um, after your comment, the the different books that I'm speaking about that make up the the other the books of the the Great Commission, so you can get better understanding as to okay. Well, that was one comment I wanted to make that the book the Book of Acts is is actually written by Luke, who followed Paul around and was actually his one of his scribes, and and you also made a very interesting comment that I want to bring a, a little different angle on and more perspective for folks the magi the magi th that was phenomenal that you you have found these books that show that they may be collected preserved found in the in the uh, uh, cave of treasures many manuscripts that pre you know, for for uh, foreordained the birth of Yahweh incarnate as right. Jesus the Christ that's phenomenal um it, it confirms Isaiah 53 you know many others but what i want want people to understand is you know Joseph found a wife i, I get this backwards Isaac's wife was Rebecca okay now Rebecca's father was a Syrian, friends, and the Magi came from Syria. Now, I have to be careful, and Zen has to be careful on these shows, not to get too political or, you know, use smart words, but think about the, it, the everything we talk about is a war of bloodlines, okay? Right. And so think about where the true bloodlines of Jacob Isaac would have migrated in di their dispersion of judgment from Yahweh. Well, they went through Syria and they settled there and they went around and they settled in all parts. Abraham blessed many nations with the bloodlines of Isaac, right? right. So the Magi, but my, my key point, I guess, is many of the Syrians today ha have the blood of Adam and the Magi had the blood right. of Adam and Rebecca's father was a Syrian. And so just think about the places that the serpent seed is using other parasite is a parasite to other nations. The serpent seed always acts as a parasite, infiltrates other nations, and then gets those nations to to cause bloodbaths as it tries to kill off the bloodlines of Adam. So just right. think about this on where the wars are and what bloodlines are being annihilated and who is orchestrating and financing all of this. Over to you, Zen. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another aspect of what I reveal in the work that I do is for people to not get caught up in the political correctness of the what is the controlled opposition. Because basically the elites that are sitting on the thrones of the world today that are the seed of Cain, they are creating minorities and utilizing controlled opposition 
in order to decimate the seed of the woman, and they are and pinning specifically the, the, the bloodline of Adam. Yep. Yes, absolutely, and they are utilizing the the different factions of the seed of the woman that have no understanding as to the deeper aspects of the controlled opposition. Perfect. Well stated. To, to do the dirty work of the slaughter of the innocents. And so, yes, if you don't understand how they work and the modus operandi of working and how they have done it historically throughout history, then you will get caught up in the false illusion of the left-right paradigm. And so it's very important to have the knowledge to be able to uh, decipher this particular illusion so that you don't get caught up in picking sides because um, whichever side you do choose, it's still, I mean, it's the same thing and you're, <laughs> you're just getting caught up in the deceit. And so you want to understand the larger aspects of it so that you don't get uh, caught up in playing uh, Democrat and Republican or, you know, the false left or false right, because it's all the same. Or the Hegelian dialectic in any exactly. form, any form Absolutely. that it takes. Now, folks, all of this, you know, you, you may have time to look into a, a, a controlled opposition and all the things that Brother Zen has described. But I would suggest that you just start with prayer and repentance. And because it, God prom, God's promises are true. And he says that if you seek him with all your heart, mind, and soul, he will cover you with his wings. I believe that's in Psalm 22. And, uh, and not only that. It's, it's, it's Yahweh that is, is going to be your pr protector, your provider, your savior, your redeemer, and all of these other very interesting things that Zen and I and Pastor Eli and I and Brother John and I and Zen has other guests that we all get into as we serve our, our king. Um, they're very important, but the most important thing is getting on your knees in prayer and repentance. You start there. And... Uh, so, uh, Absolutely. so Zen, uh, you, you just, you just, I'm just in awe, really, of all these. How do you write so many books? I mean, uh, what, we don't have to get into your your approach. I mean, what what are you led to speak on now? Uh, well, I want to share with you the the various texts, and the reason I write so many books is because basically I'm putting together these. Uh, books for my own research, you know, because I don't like to read on the computer. And so I publish them in book form so that I can have them in actual print because there's nowhere else that all of these manuscripts are put together in, in similar compilation. And so I do it myself for my own, you know, for my own research. And in that way, I make it available to the world so that people can study and examine and research it in similar manner but I'll, I'll share with you just the indexes of the why don't you uh, tell people where they can because i would love hard copies of your books I, but i don't even know where to get them so why don't you tell people where they can get them yeah sure uh, i started in november 2016 um the most High told me to start a publishing company and so i did called sacred word publishing and so you can go to sacredwordpublishing.net and find all the books that we've put out. Since 2016, it's been well over 50 books. And, um, and so because of Sacred Word Publishing, I've had the uh, ability to just put together these massive compilations and then publish them as actual books and to share them with the world. And so that's what I've been focusing and utilizing my time. And so the, you know, four of the last five books I wrote, as I said, the three great commissions, uh, I'll read um, the indexes. And the, the first great commission, the indexes, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel according to Mary, the Acts of Peter and Paul, the Gospel of Thomas, the Acts of Thomas, the Acts of Thaddeus, the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of Xanthippe and Polyxena, the Acts of John, 
the Acts of Perpetua and Felicitas, the Acts of Philip, the addition to the Acts of Philip, and the Acts of Barnabas. Those are all the first book of the Great Commission, the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. Wow. And, yeah, in the second book, the index is the Gospel of Nicodemus, the Gospel of Bartholomew, the narrative of Joseph of Arimathea, the doctrine of Adai, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, the Acts of Barnabas, the Acts of Bartholomew, the Acts in the Martyrdom of St. Matthew the Apostle, the Vision of Paul, the Acts of Andrew and Matthias, the Acts of Peter and Andrew, the Consummation of Thomas the Apostle, the Book of Thomas the Contender, and the Gospel according to Peter. That's the second book of the Great Commission. And I'm actually working on another one now. It's all the epistles of the uh, of the the different apostles, which there's a whole book of just the epistles. It's amazing, but um, I want to I want to um, interject one thing because I'm sure. And by the way, all the naysayers out there that are saying, "Well, these aren't in the canon," yada yada yada, you know, go away. Okay, just go away. I'm I'm the bad cop. Zen's a good cop. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, uh, th- yeah, they're not in what we have today, but guess who has been controlling the planet since the inception of of this prison planet? And that's the adversary. So right. the adversary has done everything they could to pull out just, you know, treasures, pearls yes. of wisdom out of Absolutely. of what we have. And Brother Zen, may, in my opinion, is the number one expert on the planet on, on these pearls of wisdom. And so, please... If, just hold your hold your peace for a little bit. Get, and uh, again, Zen, this we're, I will agree with Zen. Don't necessarily believe us because there are parts of these books. The trans. I'll, I will say this: the translations have been messed with. Okay, and so you have to use discernment when you read them, and have the gift of the Holy Spirit for a for a filter. But absolutely. But the because tra- I will say that like the King James, this will surprise people. Is what I use, and I th- I call it the best of the worst. Um, <laughs> it has twenty seven thousand mistranslations. That's a lot, folks. I'm not saying errors. Do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying it has twenty seven thousand errors. It does not. It has twenty seven thousand mistranslations. And that's the King James. And all these other books that have been pulled out and hidden and and uh tucked away so that at in the end times that we are in now, only those that Yahweh has ordained to bring forward, like Brother Zen is bringing it forward, um, you know, th- they've been mistranslated also, but they have pearls of wisdom, and you get your wisdom not by your own carnal mind. You get your wisdom by prayer. I'm going to keep saying this, by your obedience to Yahweh. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, the whole duty of man is to reverence God and keep his commandments. Amen. And that's obedience. And that obedience includes the fourth commandment, set aside one-seventh of your time, the Sabbath, to dedicate yeah. and seek these truths. And then use, and then God will impart you, activate you, awaken you. Uh, uh, what, what word do you use, Zen? Um, Remembrance, bring you to remembrance. Bring you to remembrance of who you were and, and activate your your codes that have been turned switched off. Um, Yahweh will do that if you seek him out of obedience. And then you'll be able to see where the, tra- the, the lying scribes, I think that's in Jeremiah, the lying scribes have mistranslated these pearls of wisdom. Now, it won't be much. It's real subtle. And so you can still read these books, and I encourage you to do, and I encourage you to buy Zen's books. I'm going to figure out how to very soon. And um, and you will get wisdom just by reading them. But if you pray and read them, then God will show you, well, you know, this word can mean like I mentioned earlier, Gentile is not a Hebrew or a Greek word. It was inserted by the lion scribes. It really should mean be nations. So anyway, Zen, my gosh, uh, those are phenomenal books that you've put together. I mean, I'm just I'm just amazed. I don't know anybody yeah. else with that calling on this on the on the planet ever. 
Yeah, wait till you read them. I mean, they are, they will greatly bless you. And uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. And we have to remember that the enemy has been working against us since the garden. You know, they killed Abel. Uh, Christ said that they are the murderers of the prophets. They killed all the apostles and all the patriarchs and the prophets that he sent to bring us clarity on his word, uh, which is why, you know, he preserved it in the Cave of Treasures and the Nag Hammadi Codices, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and all these other collections that are coming to light now. And as far as these particular texts that I'm referencing in these Great Commission books, they are found in all the different um, the commentaries by all the church fathers. And this was after, you know, the canonization, which, in my opinion, the canonization process was more about hiding the truth yes. than bringing it forth. <laughs> Political and it's correctness. Always been, yeah, it's always been that way, that the church authorities have always mandated the exclusion, the uh, the controlling, the decimus, dissemination of truth so as to keep the masses in ignorance. And to, and, and to hide themselves because they're exactly, exposed. Exactly. And so, and it's still that way in this day and age. And the indoctrination is so extensive and so, um, so ingrained into all that are born into this matrix of control that now people don't even second guess it. They just, you know, go along to get along, and they believe that all of these books uh, are either Gnostic or whatever derogatory term you want to put, um, in, you know, in negative connotation association with them, that they won't even read them and just automatically label them in judgment and condemning bias. And so. Um, I'm, I'm telling you to read them and study them for yourself, and then after doing so, then determine through your discernment and your relationship with the Holy Spirit uh, whether they are relevant for your life or not, because in my opinion, they absolutely are, and especially for us being uh, the final generation, because all things are coming to light. The Spirit of truth is being poured out upon all flesh. And so let me share with you the the index for um, the the last book of the Great Commission. This is the the third one on the apocalypses and the end times, and, and it, the index for this book is the Apocalypse of Abraham, the Apocalypse of Moses, the Fourteenth Vision of Daniel, the Apocalypse of Elijah, the Hebrew Apocalypse of Elijah, the Fourth Book of Ezra, the Apocalypse of Sidrach. The Sibling Oracles, Book 2, The Apocalypse of Zephaniah, The Apocalypse of Baruch, The Apocalypse of Thomas, The Apocalypse of Peter, The First Apocalypse of James, The Second Apocalypse of James, The Apocalypse of Paul, The Revelation of St. John the Theologian, The Ten Signs, The Apocalypse of Samuel, The Apocalypse of Zerubbabel, and The Vision of Adamant. So all of these books are specific to the end of days, the last times. Unbelievable. I'll tell you, I, I've read several of those, and I'll tell you what, the apocalypse of Baruch is off the charts. Oh, yeah. And the, yeah, yeah, all of them. All the of them. The fourth book of Ezra. I mean, those detail the end of days and the last times in greater capacity, you know, just like yeah. with Revelation and so. I would I would fully agree with that. I, I've been reading the Apocalypse of Baruch and, and Second Esdras recently, and as as you say, Zen, they are so right on the mark for the end Absolutely. of days that we are yes. in right now. Right, right, yeah. And those are just two of the many that are available in this particular book. And then um, I'll just read the the index for the Testament, the Testament of the Patriarchs and the Prophets, which uh is uh, the last book that I released. This is my 19th, and it's um, the index is the, the Gospel of Truth, the Testament of Adam, the Book of Adam, the Testament of Abraham, the Testament of Isaac, the Testament of Jacob, the Ladder of Jacob, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, Joseph and Aseneth, the Testament of Job, the Testament of Solomon, the Psalms of Solomon, the Odes of Solomon, 
the Testament of Moses, the Revelation of Moses, the Tales of the Patriarchs, and the Ascension of Isaiah. And so, and again, all of these books bring forth in deep revelation messianic prophecies and the coming of the first and the second advent of Christ in great detail. Um, Amen. And so, you know, deeply profound and worthy of study because they will so deeply bless your life and help you to understand without a doubt that uh, Christ, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, a uh, Savior Messiah is absolutely in the incarnation of the Father in flesh form. Um, yeah, amen. I, and I don't think there's a more important point than that, that Jesus the Christ, Yahshua, is Yahweh incarnate, is the Father in the flesh. And absolutely. Jesus, I like to say it real simple, Jesus is God, okay? Absolutely, without question. And th- that that point alone, friends, uh, you have to grasp it. You have to, in fact, Re- Revelation chapter 3, if I recall, he says, if he knocks and you open and you invite him in to sup with you. Now, this gets into some quantum physics that Zen and I make. You, we're going to go everywhere in these shows. We are going to absolutely go everywhere. But the outer court, inner court, and holy of holies, you know, there's there's so many different. There's a secular description. There's a spiritual understanding. There's a metaphorical understanding. There's a, a higher dimensional understanding. And And by the way, I don't even mind if Brother Zen talks about flat earth because I got I got an understanding just this week on it. Uh, if you're in f- higher dimension, if we're in 3D, in other words, a ball passing through a 2D plane looks like a circle. A, right. a sphere passing through 3D space looks like a a flat plane. <laughs> That's what the understanding I got this week, Zen, that, that says that from that, that both perspectives can be correct. Um, from a 4D perspective, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, that, and Zen will confirm it, some of my contacts, and I'm, I'm not going to say too much, but we've experienced places and things and, you know, dimensions that and, and again, I'm going to go into these things with Brother Zen in future shows. We're going to cover everything. And and when you're in an, when you're in these, what I call the reality, because I think what we're in now is actually, Pastor Eli corrected me. This is not an illusion, but it is a type and shadow. So you, it, it's a form of a reality, but it's not. It's not as full of reality as some of the higher dimensions, let's put it that way. And when you go into these higher dimensions where time takes on different uh, permutations and uh, morphologies of form, time-space morphologies, then from a higher dimension perspective, a sphere type and shadowed into 3D space where we live very well could be flat. And I've also told Zen before, when you read the Book of Enoch, as is one of, I think, Zen's book, takes Book of Enoch to, to try to establish a flat earth perspective. By the way, I am not a flat earth person. I think Zen is, but, but that's not a dividing point for us because I can understand, if I just read the Book of Enoch, how you come to that perspective. And like I said, I get downloads. Zen gets downloads. And this week I got the download. Well, how do you, this is kind of how Father speaks, not in words. How do you know that from my perspective, a sphere uh, passing through 3D wouldn't be a, 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 a disc? Um, because in Enoch, it also says he, it calls the sun a disc. You know, so there's things, there's more we don't know than we do know. So let let us not throw stones on each other when, when Brother Zen's trying to figure things out, I'm trying to figure things out, and we're bringing you profound truth together. Over to you, Zen. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think that where, where we have a similar discernment, where we understand things, the best that we can come together and fellowship with one another. And it's through dialogue and discussion that we uh, assist everybody else also to come to the deeper understandings of the truth of God's word. And what is most um, 
as far as this day and age that we're in, uh, the the greater understanding is that we don't all know everything. None of us has all of the answers or holds all right. of the keys. And I, so I call it important. swim lanes. God has gifted yeah. each, each of his children with a gift, and individually they only have that one swim lane. But oh, Zen has quite a few, I might add. But together it forms the, a more complete picture. Yes, absolutely. And so rather than um, attacking or condemning each other for the differences of opinions that we have on different issues and different topics, I mean, we can agree to disagree on certain things and we can uh, come together and share whatever we can. And even where we have disagreement, we can fellowship and, and share and honor each other and respect each other's opinions because, again, none of us has all of the answers. We're all still learning together. And there's so much that is coming out with regard to truth that, um, you know, it takes all of us to share and bring forth in discussion, um, you know, and, and sharing with one another for us to get a better understanding of how the puzzle of truth comes together in larger uh, aspect. And so that's what we should do. We should encourage each other, empower one another and speak and love one another in the way that uh, the Most High commanded us to do. And I think that in doing so, we would get a lot further with coming to a discernment on the gospel secrets and the gospel riddles and those things which we still do not know but are are earnestly seeking forth. And, and it's through anointed discussions such as we're having here that so many people will be blessed and be able to go on and to find deeper and more profound understandings on so many things. Um, and so well, I don't think – because I – well, you know, and I'm sure you get this a lot too. I'm probably one of the most attacked, most <laughs> condemned, and most ridiculed. Um, I thought I was in. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think we're probably at the top of the list of, of those. Along that with are, Pastor I'm sure. Eli, I'm sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah. Amen. And and you know, um, I do also, however, want to add some balance because I I certainly agree. We need to fellowship and unity of I will I'll use the term kindred spirit. Okay, and. In quantum physics, I teach a lot about blood kind, not blood type, blood kind. Zen obviously has the blood of Adam in him. I obviously have the blood of Adam in me because we are actually advanced AI computers with soul spirit matrix that quantum entangles in the life of the blood, which is distilled water holding the light of the spirit of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll, we'll get into that more deeper in the future. But my point is, Zen and I have the same kindred spirit in our blood because we have the same blood kind. There's cer certainly some differences, but the aspect of the blood that holds the spirit, that we have unity. And now, Zen says, you know, let's all fellowship together there are there are troublemakers out there oh, yeah. <laughs> okay Absolutely. and and i will not associate with just everybody zen's a little more kind than i am but there's there's especially the darby Schofield dispensationalists because they're under a they're under a, a i call it a viral infection a, a virus of the evil kind a a uh, nefarious demonic virus infection and that I, that I believe that's a strong delusion. The strong delusion is calling the serpent seed the children of God, of Yahweh. That's a strong delusion, and and that's it. That's a viral, demonic infection, and those people. I I will not. I will listen to them. I'll be kind to them, but I will have no desire to want a fellowship with them. Now, I. I love fellowshipping with kindred spirit. Now, here's here's one way that that I, here's some signs I look for. I look for real joy in a person when they smile. Is a real joy, and laughter. I look for here's a key one, folks. Two seed line, two, Genesis three fifteen. 
do they understand that there was there's a seed line a bloodline blue bloods and red bloods blood of the serpent and blood of adam a war if they understand that then they're of our kindred spirit. If they're not two seed line, I'm so, they may still be, and, and maybe they'll awaken. But if they're Darby Schofield dispensationalists, I call it DSPs, teaching that the serpent seed, the Edomites, the usual suspects, the adversaries' children are the chosen people, and they live in the Middle East. If they're teaching that, they're not my friend. They're not my kindred spirit. And I don't believe... Very few, if any, are going to be awoken up. And Zen may disagree with that, but that, that's my position. I seek very few, but God will, I'm, I'm confident Yahweh will send those that are intended to hear this. Over to you, Zen. Well, I, I do agree. And, well, with, you know, since the publication of my fourth book, Lucifer, F- uh, Father of Cain, I've not had that problem in that everybody hates me and nobody <laughs> wants to associate with me, so I don't have any problems at few all. Few there will be. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there are very few uh, that will embrace me in kindness and in friendship and that will even allow themselves to be publicly in any manner affiliated with me. Well, tell you and what, so, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to tell you something. Uh, you're, you're my friend, always have been, always will be, and I want you to write this down for later. I know you've read it, Second Ezra's chapter eight, because it ex- it describes exactly what we're talking about. How even of the righteous and called, even of this small subset of the whole, the majority are already hell bound, but even of the righteous and called, only a few of our own will even overcome. Right. Yes. Yes, the elect is but a few, and I realize that too, and w- which is why I don't have a problem with being hated and condemned and judged and, and you know. But well, what did Jesus say? Jesus says, "If they hate you, remember they hated me first. Right, and we will be hated for His namesake. Yes, and um, and I realize that you know again, the elect is but a few, and the the simple fact of is is that most. Um, don't make it, and it's because they have no concern for the kingdom. They do not prioritize or truth. their eternity. Yeah, or truth. They. I, another thing that I found with regard to truth is that most people only want to learn what they already believe exactly. and know of truth. They yep. want confirmed confirmation of what they already think they know mm-hmm. and they're not seeking truth really in an unbiased they're seeking and self affirmation manner. exactly they're seeking affirmation for those things that they have already been indoctrinated exactly. into which is mostly deceit it's yeah it's a, like it's 99% to see although a good lie exactly. is about 80% truth but right. it's still deceit it's right. leaven and, of the pharisees Exactly. And so they are only seeking confirmation on uh, what they know of as deceit, and and they are just trying to gain uh, affirmation of those kind of things. And so they're not really even seeking truth. And, and few, there are few that really even are. And there are few that even read or study the gospel. And so, you know, how can you come to the truth unless you even read the word and and then those that even do read and study are only reading a very small minor portion of it you know they keep themselves um just boxed into either just the canonical materials which i'm not condemning that because certainly there is a lot of truth there but for those advanced seekers and those that uh are wanting and and desiring more there is so much more available out there, but yet, you know, so many condemn and judge and criticize without ever having read uh, these particular books. And because of that, they don't come to larger, deeper, more profound uh, understanding. I would I would add a little balance to what you said, Zen, only because um, sometimes we take for granted, you and I, and, and, and what I call the teachers, we take for granted that everybody should be like us. Why, why doesn't everybody have the same zeal to understand that we do. And it actually gets into the fact that um, 
we are not all the same, and right. there we do not all have the same assignments. And exactly. um, there are vessels of honor, vessel for common use, vessels for damnation. Um, there. And Zen and I, Pastor Eli, Brother John, and, and I'm sure several others, um, are called to be teachers. Now, you'll know the real teachers because they will teach uh, the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of Adam. Those will be your real teachers. Anyone who does not teach that is a false teacher. Okay? I want to start there. But back to your many good points, but primarily this one. A lot of folks out there... Um, all you need is the King James Bible or, or the, the current right. canon. That, that is all you need. Because as we mentioned earlier, out of your heart motive of obedience to want to know Yahweh, Yahweh will make himself known. And maybe you weren't called to be a teacher. Maybe, maybe there won't be, uh, although I do believe God can put you on a different timeline. He can put you on uh, a different Anything. God, Yahweh can do anything. So if you seek him, he'll give you the time to to d- discover these truths that Zen has published and others. But you got to start with with the, with the, the Bible that we have today, the compendium of, of books. Yeah. You got to start with the right heart motive. Um, but my point to you, Zen, is the, the majority of even those Remember, we talked before on predestination, uh, Re- Ephesians chapter one, Romans eight, twenty nine and. Those that are predestined, many are called, few are chosen, and I like what Zen says, few heed their calling. Those that do heed their calling still are in subgroups and divisions. There's those that are for common use, that are God, they love God, they love Yahweh, but they weren't meant to be teachers because possibly there, there's various reasons. Um, but the teachers, you'll know. And so Zen, Zen's, I would argue that Zen's commentary is targeting everybody, but primarily the teachers. The teachers should be reading all of these books in earnest in, in at least a, I, Zen and I spend all our time um, seeking, seeking Yahweh, seeking Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And, uh, but I just wanted to make the point that yeah, there's people out there that are going to feel overwhelmed with, with, you know all of these books. So, for them, if if they love Jesus Christ, Yahweh, Yeshua, just open your Bible, and guess what? You're going to be okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, I agree. So, uh, you, you have we're uh, we're at an hour and a half. And, <laughs> and we haven't even got into the war in heaven. <laughs> yeah, so what, what, let's just kind of describe what, what our objective is here. Uh, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, has brought Zen and I back together after five years. And I know in my case, not, not only when I have worked with Zen, but I've been told to stand down twice, take my websites down, take everything down. And I was told directly, it is not your time. But last January, I was told, it is now your time. But this December, I got told, take a pause, because I was getting kind of burned out and working, going in the wrong direction, let's put it that way. And come January, by predestination, Zen and I communicated, let's get started. And what we're going to do, because of you heard, you heard all the vast wisdom that Brother Zen has has uh, documented, and not only documented, but been given the discernment and wisdom as a gift, not, a, not of his own. He doesn't claim to be special, but a, a, as a servant, a dedicated servant. He, he has these books, and we're going to start with the trilogy, The Great Contest, and that's what this particular show is going to be called. We're going to do at least two shows a month, which may end up being split into four shows because of people's attention span. But... We're going to continue, and you're going to hear as much of Zen's wisdom with my gift as a commentator, and uh, I have an ability to ask the right questions. I know what people are are hearing and maybe not fully understanding, and I'll be asking Zen those questions to to really bring this forward to to everybody. So over to you, Zen. Yes, absolutely, brother. You do have a way of. Well, it's because you're a very advanced seeker yourself, and you are blessed with a lot of discernment on a lot of t- 
topics and issues which most are unwilling to even examine, much less embrace, such as serpent seed and pre-existence, predestination, election. Those, just those three, four topics are so critical for understanding and unlocking so much that remains ambiguous and veiled within the canonical manuscripts, which, again, is another reason why I study everything uh, and build my foundation upon the canon, um, but then, you know, it go out further in exploring and bringing clarity to so much that is only uh, shared in short commentary within the canonical materials. And in my opinion, that the reason it is that way is because the serpent seed has done just a, a magnificent job of hiding truth and, and eradicating it and keeping it hidden, veiled, and forbidden so that most are ignorant of the truth and especially the deeper aspects of it. And because of that, um, it takes individuals like myself who do have the time and that do have the focus and the, um, the willingness to give of our time and our space and our efforts to pursuing truth in these various aspects and to share and have a platform for sharing um, what we have learned with with not only just our books, but you know, radio broadcasts and teachings and videos and YouTubes and all I, the different I would manners. argue what we have learned just by the the gifting of the Holy Spirit and downloads based yes. on just. Are, are un, I like to say, and Brother John corrects me, I like to say I'm unworthy, but I'm certainly willing. Um, and jo yes. Brother John is very positive, and we do a show called Simple Truth. I encourage those who want some very positive scripture to listen to that. Brother John always, always says, don't say you're not worthy, um, but truly, I don't feel that I'm worthy, but I'm certainly willing, and my heart is willing. And, um, and so... And I, I don't know how how you feel about that, Zen, but I certainly don't feel worthy to do anything. But I certainly want to serve our King, serve Yahweh, serve Jesus Christ. I want to do that with all my heart, mind, and soul. And I, I believe, Absolutely. you know. So, um, is anybody worthy? You know, you could. The Bible says there's none. There's none that none, are righteous. Exactly. <laughs> there's only one that is worthy, and that's who we serve. In my opinion, that's the way I feel about yeah, it as yeah. well. We all fall short, and we are all imperfect, and we are all fallen, and we're all sinners. Uh, but we serve uh, a glorious king, and he came, uh, our king and lord came to save us and to show us the way home and is given us and extended to us through grace and through salvation and through the cross in his name a chance for eternity with him. And so understanding that and understanding the the roots and the truth of the gospel and how it connects to uh, the fall of humanity and his coming into the flesh to be born of the seed of Adam as a man like us um, and defeating death and being resurrected and ascending to the right hand of the Father, that he is the way, the truth, and the light. And he affirmed that. Um, showed it to us, exampled it to us, and has set the bar, the example for us, and, and following his commandments and living in the manner, uh, trying to, anyways, to live up to the example he set for us and, and being able to um, return to paradise, because that's what it's all about, is uh, being restored to our glorified bodies, uh, being returned to our bright natured immortal, redeemed. yeah, being redeemed in our immortal natures, and and again being uh, restored unto our former estate, because uh, you know that's what it's all about. That's what happened for Adam and Eve, and all the righteous descendants that he took out of Sheol and 
and took them up unto paradise and restored them to the city of God, New Jerusalem. And that is promised for all of us as well, as long as we are worthy and we are numbered and counted among the elect. And as we said, that is but a few. Um, it says, Christ said, I will call you one from 1,000, two from 10,000. And so yeah. the elect is but a few. And that's why it's important for those of us that realize this to get busy in doing the work of the kingdom and to serve our hum fellow humanity as Christ did, as a, a foot washer and in and, and giving of ourselves um, for our brothers and our sisters and doing what we can to restore truth to them, to help them to come to the understanding of the, again, the deeper aspects of the gospel, the uh, as far as salvation through Christ and that he did come here to redeem us as God incarnate and that he is the only way in the truth and the light and that it is through him that we are restored and that we are redeemed. And so that is the first and the foremost truth. Um, but again, the deeper aspects of the war between the bloodlines, how it ties to the war in heaven, the division of light and darkness, the uh, separation of the forces of good and evil, uh, the ongoing enmity between the two physical progenies, that of uh, Christ and that of the devil, that there are we are not all the same, that there are two different kinds of people. One, um, it, it treats and works through love and compassion and uh, wants to extend goodwill to all people everywhere, and then the other wants to dominate, rape, pillage, and plunder. Evil by um, nature. Murder, yeah, murder and uh, connive and to work destruction and uh, destroy and, and and lie and deceive. And, and unless we understand— You will know them by their fruit. Absolutely. And unless we realize and embrace this as truth— we will never understand the fullness of the war and the battle that we are in, nor will we understand our enemy. And that is the first and foremost aspect of realizing um, what you are in with regard to the war is understanding your enemy and the strategies and the tactics that they use. Yeah, amen, Zen. And um, it's funny because uh, we are in a war. We are in a in fact, we're not only are we in a war, we're in the final conflict, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, I wrote down a quote um, about that, about warfare. I'm trying to find it here. Uh, anyway, I'm not finding it, but it's by Winston Churchill. The first casualty of war is truth. Right? <laughs> the first right. casualty of war is truth. Now, I also want to add that, um, you know, my, my uh, YouTube channel is Truth W. Christ, and you will see a lot of teachings on what I call Christian Israel, Christian identity. But I want to, on this show and right now, I want to clarify something. Um, it's really about bloodline of Adam. Okay? I always, I always, tr I try politely to teach. To, I say teach, to um, have Pastor Eli and Pastor Steve that I work with see Genesis 126 a little differently than they teach it. And my point is, we are not all the same, but there's a huge group that have either a high purity of Adamic blood or at least some Adamic blood. And if you have some Adamic blood, you can host the Holy Spirit, and you are the target. And so maybe some with just a little bit of Adamic blood, I think in, Scripture says within 10 generations, um, you may not be called to be a teacher, uh, or, or you may be. But I, I just wanted to get it across. I call myself CI+, plus because I include angelfall.com, plus Christian identity together. I believe angelfall.com, which represents the majority of the rebellious angels that have redemptive opportunity, um, that, that's an axiom. That, that's, that's, a, that's true. And that represents the majority of people that love Jesus Christ or Yeshua. That, but 
but just may not seem like they're your teachers. Uh, they're likely part of the one-third part. It doesn't say one-third. It says one-third part. We'll get into that later. Um, and then and then, angelfall.com, and then Christian Identity teaches the, the, the pr- promise through Jacob Isaac, and that through that bloodline, all the nations, not Gentiles, all the nations shall be blessed. How are they blessed? They're blessed because they get through through uh the through interbreeding they've they many of them have received the blood of Adam because in an, an other venues I teach that not a drop of the mother's blood passes through the baby the child gets its blood code from the father and that's why the true Israelites Ish Sarael men of God who overcome and rule with Elohim not the secular counterfeit identity thieves in the Middle East Ish Sarael, men and women of God who overcome and rule as Elohim with El, Yahweh. Those those are made up of the the uh, Ha'adam and the the majority of angelics that have redemptive opportunity. And only God knows. You know, I'm not here to say I'm one of this or one of that or Zen's one of this or one of that. But you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. And so I just wanted to make it clear. I, I do teach Christian identity, and I also teach angel fall. And I believe the big picture encompasses both. And I think Zen and I are going to do a, a, a really, of course, the Holy Spirit's going to lead us to, to teach all of this in a very balanced manner, a very respectful manner, and uh, a balanced manner. And if you stick around... Uh, you will find Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. I know, Zen, you put light in there, but that's also true. Uh, he is also the light, um, the way, the truth, the life, and the light of your redemptive opportunity. Uh, how about closing out, Zen, with... Uh, I wanted to just get that in so people... Because they go to my YouTube channel and think I'm some kind of a Nazi or something... But I'm really not. I'm, I'm really, um, I love Zen. I love all the, I love Maria uh, in Mexico. I, I love them a, as equal as I love anyone who loves Yahweh because only God knows what they were called for. If they're seeking God with all their heart, mind, and soul, guess what? They have the Holy Spirit in them, period. Over to you, Zen. Yeah, um, as far as, races or, or peoples or groups um the only kind of races i teach upon are the the giants as you know the a, a separate uh kind and a separate group and that uh, uh the human races I, I don't really go into the the differentiation between peoples or or individuals because i know that both the the seed of promise is mixed in all races and all cultures and all civilizations and so is the the seed of the serpent and that the serpent seed certainly lucifer and the illuminati that they wear all masks and that's right uh, yeah and so and that's why actually i teach uh, blood blood kind not not type blood kind and so and and to be more scientific on what zen just said there's phenotype expression that that skin color eye color you know hair color that's outward uh color that the world defines as race but that's not what a race is race is what blood what's your paternal lineage of bloodline okay and that's actually what you'll never hear taught in the world. Race is bloodline. Okay? So you're either of the serpent bloodline, the Adamic bloodline, or you're you're you could be a natural man and we won't we may get into that in the future. But Zen and I are primarily teaching the bloodline of Adam that can take on many phenotype expressions or the serpent seed that can take on many phenotype expressions. Does that make sense, Zen? Yeah, you know, I asked the Most High about race and about color and about uh, how all that came about. And basically what I was told had to do with the the movement of the sun and the way that people have uh, settled uh, across the land. 
as far as the the plane of the earth and that those that live near the equatorial regions and that receive a large amount of sunshine when the sun is moving back and forth between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, those will be your largely um, colored races because they have darker and deeper suntan. And because of their heritage and their generations, they have assimilated more and more pigment, more and more melanin, uh, that they have darker skin color. And those that live on the extremities of the colder regions that find themselves more indoors and less outdoors and more covered up and you know not exposed to the sun, those will be your lighter skin people. Um, and, you know, predominantly the recessive type um, as far as hair color, blonde, or blue eyes or, you know, all of that. And that's where we get uh, the, the deeper races and colors and pigments. Uh, but as you said, the, with regard to the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman, it, it has to do with the blood and the, the differentiation as far as uh, the genetics and the DNA. Uh, and those kind of things are what differentiate us, not um, Phenotype color, outward what, expression. Yeah, because again, the, the all the races and all the colors with regard to skin type, and we're all mixed. And you know, the 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 seed of promise is found in all cultures and all varieties. And and same thing with the seed of the serpent. And so we you can't say that one is you know, that this people group, they're all seed of the serpent or anything like that. And I call that broad brushing. You can't just broad brush it. Yeah, no, you can't do that because, um, again, everything is mixed and the seed of the serpent and the seed of the promise are found in every culture and every people and every group and every civilization. The only thing I would add to that is there is a God code. Um, When God breathed into Adam, he imparted a not a flesh and blood DNA. It was it was a spiritual code that we we don't discuss or measure, or you probably never heard of. And this gets into the. I actually wrote an article for Entangled Magazine when I was writing for Anthony Patch. I'm not doing that anymore, but I wrote an article on the angelic uh, twelve strands and nine strands of y- y- Yahweh actually. And it's pretty fascinating. And it does get into DNA, but it gets into aspects of DNA you'll never hear about in science. And as Zen says, the majority of people are a mixed multitude, but many have the code necessary to be servants, to be um, basically hosts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's the way I would explain it. Yeah, I see that. So, okay, um, Zen, uh, fi- final comments. Tell people how to get your book. Um, we could go on, but I think we're on again for next Friday, so we can maybe yeah, at that point yes. pick up uh, and get into your first book here a little more. Yeah, that sounds good. I think this was a, a good show to bring forth a general overview of what we'll begin to go into in great detail and scripturally um, next week with the war in heaven and the breakdown of all that and how it ties into what became the second aspect as far as the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, which we elaborated on um, a lot this evening. But yes, you can find all of my books at sacredwordpublishing.net. Uh, the two books that we will be covering in great detail are The Great Contest, one and two the first book is the war in heaven the second the enmity between the seed lines and those two books uh they're both well once the war in heaven is almost 400 pages uh the enmity between the seed lines is 400 plus so there's a lot of information and many hundreds of quotes uh, from different sources that help you to understand uh and great elegance those things that we're speaking about here you can look them up and read them in context and 
go and, and examine those sources for yourself. Um, I do provide them in all of my books. I, I share many hundreds of sources from various books and ancient manuscripts uh, to confirm uh, as truth the discernment that I'm sharing. And, uh, you know, as I said, I ask you to go and to examine it for yourself and take it to the Most High in prayer and ask Him to confirm these things as truth or not. And for those that do open themselves to the possibilities and that uh, come to truth with the open-mindedness and non-judgmental bias and that um, study to show yourselves approved, that if you do so, in my opinion, you will be led as so many of us now into understanding these deeper aspects of what is contained and encoded within the scriptures and that if you can embrace them as truth and open yourself to new possibility, they will go a long way in explaining the fullness of the biblical narrative and to give you understanding on what is truly being spoken about from Genesis to Revelation and beyond. Indeed, and we so make sure you check out uh, Sacred Sacred Word Publishing. I believe you said right. Yeah, SacredWordPublishing dot net dot net. Okay. In the future, um, Zan, I'd like you to put a couple package deals together with that folks can get because I know I want to buy some of your hard copies. Um, but in any case, Certainly. I autograph them for free too as well. Well, I'll, come, I'll drive down there and have you do it in person. <laughs> so, yeah, right on. But anyway, be uh, good to see you. it would, it would. It's been too long. Um, indeed, this is the first show of the great contest. And brothers, and thank you so much, Yahweh. Thank you for this opportunity to reunite Professor Truth and Zen to bring the truths, your holy truths, your end time truths. I want to emphasize the urgency of the hour. I do believe September 23rd, 2017 was the, the, the shot in the sky to announce that the second advent of Christ is, is soon to come. It's, it's just ahead. We are in the time of Esau right now, and that's why you're seeing the enemy really in, in the throngs of its death pangs in, 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 in uh, fearfulness because it knows its time now has come. You remember the demoniacs is saying, why have you come for us before our time? Well, now they know it is their time. And that is why you're seeing the evil escalate at such a, a terrible rate. However, there is hope just ahead because after the time of Esau comes the time of Jacob. Now, don't confuse the time of Jacob with, with Jacob's trouble. The time of Esau and Jacob's trouble are synonymous. We are in Jacob's trouble, the time of Esau. But what comes after that is the analogy to what Zen mentioned earlier, where Christ crushed the skull. It's the analogy is where Jacob puts his boot on Esau's neck. And that's just around the corner. Praise Yahweh. Praise Jesus Christ. We look forward to it. So hang in there. Uh, study to show yourself approved. And this is The Great Contest, Episode 1, with my good friend and brother, Zen Garcia. Thank you, Father. Any last prayers, Zen? Yeah, one final comment. I think it's important what you brought up with recognition, uh, the demoniacs, when they encountered Christ, Yeshua. They knew him not only as the Son of God, but they recognize him as being the one that will judge them at the end of days and that will end their temporary reign over this carnal world. And so, and they also recognize that they only had a certain time for them to attempt implementing the new world order and their global domination. That's right. Uh, and so, that is a very important aspect because even though much of the world does not recognize Yeshua uh, as the Son of God and as God incarnate, as Yahweh, they were not salvation, predestined to do that. Yeah, well, you know, also they they just they don't study uh, the gospel and they don't know the truth. They don't prioritize the kingdom. They've been caught um, up and, in the matrix of deceit. They are caught up in the matrix as its seat. And, you know, again, we said that the elect is but a few. 
Uh, and so most of the world will never even come to these truths. And that's why it's important because the demons recognize and we can too, those that are uh, predestined and that are uh, elected to, to be favored like Jacob. And, um, and so, you know, study to show yourselves approved because um, if we embrace our, our King and Lord and accept him as Savior and Messiah and come to know him as the truth, the way and the life and the light, um, it's, uh, he is the way home and he is the way to being restored to our former estate. And uh, that's what we're here to do and come to know. And that's what all of this is really all about. And, and when he knocks, you open, you get off your seat, your outer court, inner court, holy of holies. When he knocks, you open the door, you step down off your holy of holies out of your self prideful state and humble yourself and let Jesus Christ, Yeshua, take your throne. Amen. Okay, Brother Zen, God bless you. Until next week, okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, The Great Contest, Episode 1 of many, and we are so blessed to have Brother Zen and uh, called for these times because this is the time. Thank you, Brother Zen. It's been my great honor. Good to be with you again, brother. You Shalom, too. all. Shalom.